Well, the weather might be gloomy, but this paint job sure isn't. This is a brand new all-electric Opel Corsa E. So Opel is back in New Zealand and they brought this car with them, the Corsa E. Okay, price and range first and foremost, this is the juicy stuff you want to know. This machine, after the clean car rebate, will cost you $51,365 and for that you get 383 Ks per charge. Now, that makes it the most affordable, brand new European electric car you can buy in the country right now. In fact, it's only a couple of grand more than a brand new Volkswagen Golf, but with an electric car, obviously, you never have to visit the gas station again. Well, having said that, some petrol stations are installing chargers, so you might still find yourself visiting one in the future to perhaps buy a pie that inexplicably costs $8.50. But anyway, about the car, it's a snazzy looking machine, riding on 17 inch diamond cut alloys with high tech headlights, which I'll explain how they work shortly, and a massive panoramic glass roof as standard. But you'll be spending most of your time inside, so let's check that out and look at that bold interior with its red highlights. The Corsa E also has a 7 inch touchscreen display with Apple, Android and CarPlay Auto, seated heats, a heated steering wheel and a 6 speaker sound system but it doesn't have wireless phone charging. And that's probably a good thing because I couldn't even fit my phone in there anyway. And speaking of fitting in, with the manually adjusted driver's seat lowered all the way down, this car should be comfortable for folks of up to around six and a half feet tall and the steering wheel is fully adjustable too. Back seat room however is snug. There's not a lot of leg room and while I'm five foot ten the ceiling was so intimately close that I could reach in and almost kiss it. Yeah don't do that. Boot space is all right though at 309 liters being just big enough for an idiot but with the seats down you get almost four times that space plus it has an acceptable PSC of 39 although the Corsa E is an electric version of a combustion car which means there's no storage space under the bonnet as that's where they've squeezed in all the electric electric car stuff. But anyway, enough talking about seats and features, it is a car after all, so let's see how it drives. And we're off, and I'm not going to lie to you, I am not a qualified Opelologist, however, I suspect that this is actually the same car underneath as the Peugeot E208. I suspect they share a lot of stuff. For example, they share the same motor, they share the same battery, they've got similar performance. But this one, the Opel Corsa E, is $4,000 cheaper. Now that appeals to my tightwad gland. It's fizzing. One question though is why? Why is this $4,000 cheaper? Because it's got all the same gadgetry. It handles just as well. If anything, I think I like this design more because the dashboard in this one is kind of traditional and normal looking, even though it's got the striking red accents. Whereas the Peugeot was really busy with piano buttons and piano switches. It reminded me a lot of the Mini Electric, which had a really busy dashboard. So many knobs and buttons trying to look cool. And that appeals to a lot of people, but not me. I'm, I'm old and boring. I'm basically an octogenarian. So this dashboard, this appeals to me much more. I like this. Although one thing that does worry me is the center console. It's got this shiny reflective plastic. And already, and this car is literally just rolled off the factory floor, already it's got scratches in there. This is a car that's going to spend most of its life in the city, we can all agree on that. But it's a nice place to be in a city car. It's comfortable, it's relatively quiet, at least at low speed. We're going to find out how loud it is on coarse chip roads later, but right now it's a pleasant place to be. The dashboard design's nice, it's comfortable, the suspension's tight, and like the Peugeot, this one has a 7 inch display. Now 7 inches isn't big by today's standards, but I find it's just the right size and it's very quick and responds fast to touch. Grow up. For example, I've got information about the car itself, I've got the GPS, I've got music control, and if I press the E button it tells me the vital stats of the motor and the battery. How much power I'm using, how much regen braking I'm using to put power back into the battery bank as I slow. It's got it all built in. It's also quite easy to use and that's good because I do happen to have the IQ of a chicken nugget but I can figure it out so that means anyone can. The car also has driving modes to suit your driving mood so if you are feeling relaxed and you want to go long distance maximize your range press the drive mode button slot it into eco mode and eco mode will make the car a little bit more sluggish underfoot. Conserves every electron make sure that you can get as close as possible to that car's estimated 383 k's per charge. However if like here you want to put it into sport mode and accelerate quickly. 
Oh yeah, I could feel the, I could see the traction control light coming on there because it was struggling to put its power to the floor and the accelerator is much more responsive. Now it doesn't turn it into a rocket ship because it only has 100 kilowatts at its front wheels. Now that's not epic, but it's not bad. It does mean that in power mode in the city, even though it will ruin your range, it's much more fun. That brings me to my next point, regenerative braking, which if you don't know what it is, basically when you take your foot off the accelerator, the car slows down and uses the motor to act as a generator. It runs in reverse, you could say. And by itself, the regenerative braking in this car doesn't really exist. <laughs> it's putting a little bit of power back into the battery bank. Let me try it on eco mode instead and see if it improves it. No noticeable improvement. But if I slot it down into B mode with pressing the button on the center console, ah, now I can feel the car really slowing down. The motor is putting much more electricity back into the battery bank when I slow down. Not enough to enable one pedal driving. It's still quite weak, the regen braking. But if you're new to electric cars, this won't frighten you. Another good thing about this car is the width. Look how narrow it is in this part of the street here. We've got cars parked on either side, oncoming traffic, but the, this is just the right size. Oops, these people did not judge their driving accurately. See, you don't have that problem with this car. You're not gonna end up in an accident like those guys. This thing you can slide straight on through with cars either side. It's just the right size for Auckland. I could see myself driving one of these things in Auckland city. But I do want to know how it handles in the countryside. For that, I'm gonna to have to take it out of the city. But before I do that, here are some family friendly info you need to know. Starting with child seating and the Corsa E has two ISOFIX connectors in the back seat, which is 122 centimeters wide, plus an extra set of ISOFIX connections in the front passenger seat. As for driver's seat height, with the seat all the way down, it's 55 centimeters off the ground. And in terms of boot space, you've got 131 centimeters from the boot lip to the back of the front seats. Plus the boot has a couple of handy metal loops for securing loads. And lastly, the quality of the six speaker sound system may not be spine tingling, but it's certainly not bad. But enough talk, it's time to go on a road trip. It's a new day and today I'm on a mission. I'm on a mission to destroy this car's range. The thing is, I've got a little bit of a road trip ahead of me. I'm gonna take this car all the way from here in central Auckland to the Waikato region south of here, and then without stopping, go all the way up to the Northland region on the other end of the scale. So this is gonna be interesting because the car only has, what, three quarters of a charge and it says it can do 383 k's per charge. Well, this journey is 208 kilometers. Now the thing is, I've only got 268 k's of range left, and I'm gonna be driving at speed, so I think I'm gonna to arrive to the charger flat, if I make it at all. Because let's be honest, driving at speed really eats the range. This will be an interesting test, and it could be the last time Opel ever gives me a car if I end up on the back of a flatbed truck. <laughs> oh boy, okay. Ah, I just realized, I have a secret weapon to extend my range. First of all, I can push B mode to give me, oh, I can feel it, much more strong regen braking, great for going down hills and putting power back into the battery. And of course I have eco mode. There we go. That's gonna maximize my range. Well, I might actually also just turn the air conditioning off a little bit, see how we go. Watch this space. I jumped on the motorway heading south, which was a great excuse to test the adaptive cruise and lane keeping assist functions. Ah, might as well get comfortable because it's going to be a long journey. The seats are actually quite comfy. Let's turn on the cruise control now so I can relax a little bit more. Cruise control on, set the speed, maximum of 100. Not that we're going to do that in this traffic. Okay, now I can see it's pulling back from the vehicle in front, which is now turning off the motorway. So I'm expecting it to start accelerating. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Okay, now I've set it to keep a far distance from the vehicle in front, but I'm gonna reduce that to a normal distance. Let's see how that works. It'll be interesting to see how smooth this is because some cars are fantastic, like the BMW iX M60, the Tesla Model 3, Tesla Model Y, and some cars are terrible, like the Addo 3 and the MG ZS EV. They don't really just keep a smooth distance from the vehicle in front. The acceleration and the braking is kind of erratic. This one seems good. 
All right, now what I'm going to do is turn on the lane keeping assist. Now this is the ultimate test. It uses the brain in the car to maintain it in the middle of the lane. Now some of the cars I've tested are brilliant. Again, some of them are nomadic and they wander around the lanes. They press the button. Okay, it's on. Let me relax my hands. Here we go. Is it going to sail around the lane? No, it's actually doing a great job. Is it going to get confused with the off ramp and try and turn left? Let's find out. No, it's doing okay, but it is taking a long time to accelerate now that the car has gone from in front of me. But it's getting up there. Oh, no, after the last couple of cars, this lane keeping assist is really smooth. It's not the best I've ever had, but it's pretty good. Yeah, I like this. This is comfortable. This is one of the better systems, especially bang for buck. Oh, hold the steering wheel. I am, I am. My hands are there, don't worry. Yeah, bang for buck, this one's not too bad. Mad Max vehicle is that? Oh, it's a railway vehicle. That's got Australian license plates on it. You lost, mate. <laughs> all right, now while the car is basically doing all the driving, I can kick back and relax and settle in for a long drive. We are now in the Waikato region, but about to leave it. As we head north, get back into the Auckland region, which is bigger than it looks, and then head to Northland. So far my economy is 15.4 kilowatt hours of electricity per 100 k's, and that's just a little bit over the official stats. So we're doing okay so far, but I have been driving fairly economically because I'm scared. I'm not gonna lie, I don't know how far this car can go per charge. We're gonna find out soon though. We've made it out into the countryside, look at that, what a sight. And there's three things I want to talk about in this car right now. Number one is the headlights. Now this car has a headlight system that I've not seen in any other car before. It's called Intellilux, I think. And it's hard to describe, so let me play this video I shamelessly stole from Opal's website. And it shows that it has an LED headlight system, this Intellilux headlight system. It changes the shape and the contours of the light beams as not to blind oncoming traffic. So that if you're going around a corner, it'll change the shape of the lights. This is great in the countryside when you're dipping your headlights a lot and you're going around corners, that sort of stuff. Really, really smart stuff. The second thing I wanna talk about is that it has a speed detection system where it can detect the road speed of the road you're traveling on right now. And at the moment it's a 100 zone, but ah, this is a good test. We're coming up to a 30 zone. And I found that this system doesn't work all the time. So I'm not sure if it uses GPS or cameras. This will be a good test because this 30 zone we're about to enter is temporary. Let's see if it changes. Does it read it? Ah, see, now that's interesting. It still says we're in a 100 zone. So I'm not sure if it uses the cameras built into the car to change the speed or not. Interesting. So it's not bad, but it doesn't work all the time. And the third thing I'd love to tell you about, but I can't, is the noise level at 100 k's an hour. Unfortunately, we are doing a grand total of zero k's an hour because of, yet again, roadworks. So let me get up to speed and I'll tell you what it is. Okay, we're back up to speed now and I've got the cruise control set at 100 k's an hour. I can finally answer the question, what's the noise level on this coarse chip road? And I suspect it's gonna be a little bit louder than some of the cars I've driven recently, just because of all the hard plastics and the hard interior. The answer is, so at about 79 decibels, it is one of the louder cars I've tested. It's not unbearable, but it does have also a lot of low frequency din. But enough with the tech stuff, there were corners to eat up. See, it doesn't handle too bad on the moderate corners. It's all right, it's pretty effortless, and I've got the speed limiter set. So in these twisty turny roads, which are really hilly, it's not gonna let me go over 100 as I go over the crest of a hill. It's good, it's gonna save me from getting ticketed. It's a great little safety feature. Oh boy, look at the range. 70 k's of range left. That's about the same distance to the charger and we haven't even got to the hilliest parts yet. My spirit of driving has decimated the range a little earlier than I thought it would. Uh, I'm just gonna put that back into eco mode now. <laughs> All right, let's see what happens. I might just drive a little more economically now. I had the last hour or so having fun and I uh, really probably should behave myself. Turns out I had nothing to worry about as just half an hour later, I was pulling into one of the many rapid charges in the Northland region. 
Right, let's plug this beast in, see how quick it charges. Okay, so if you haven't used one of these things before, it's pretty straightforward. You can use a mobile app or your ChargeNet key fob, which I have. Swipe it in front of the device. You choose your plug type. CCS is the most common plug, and this machine has two CCS plugs. So you take the charger. When you've got the charger, you plug the device into the car, and the charger does the rest. As for charging speed, it's ramped up quickly to 100 kilowatts, which is not super fast, but certainly not slow. That means that to charge this car up to 80% full, we're probably looking at about 30 minutes. We'll find out very soon. So the beast is charging, and as for the electricity that's feeding this car right now, it is 100% fat-free, guilt-free electricity. It's all renewable. That's because the power that ChargeNet uses on their rapid and hyper-rapid chargers is from Ecotricity, which makes these videos possible. Ecotricity is New Zealand's only Carbon Zero certified electricity provider, meaning just wind, hydro and solar, nothing else. So why not sign up at ecotricity.co.nz, eliminate your carbon footprint, save a bit of money and get yourself some green cred. Seriously, there is no downside. Now the car's charging, I can quickly talk about the battery warranty while the air conditioning is going. It's great that I can run the aircon and the heater while the car is charging. The battery warranty in this car is for 160,000 Ks or up to eight years, which means that by 2030, I'll be 50. Oh, I don't even want to think about that. This car will not have lost more than 30% in capacity. If it has, they'll fix it for you. I don't want to be 50 though. <laughs> okay, so it's been almost 32 minutes and we're at 82% charge. Now that's not bad. That's basically 80%, 30 minutes. So let's stop that unplug and get on our way and we are off and I just got a text message from ChargeNet telling me how much that charging session cost to get from 11% full to 82% full cost just over 21 bucks and that gave me 300 kilometers of usable range it's not bad when was the last time you drove 300 kilometers for 21 bucks not since the 80s and if you were to charge at home it gets even better like most EV owners the vast majority, around 90% or so, they charge at home because the electricity is even cheaper. And if you were to use Ecotricity's EcoSaver plan, this is a great plug for them because it's a great plan, then you'd charge the car the same amount of electricity would cost you about nine bucks. Really? Nine bucks? 300 kilometers? That's not bad. And not only that, the EcoSaver plan's got some other benefits. Like in the weekends, it's off peak time all weekend, the entire weekend, every weekend. So you can charge your car non-stop every weekend, just drive, 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 and it costs you next to nothing. And of course, it's clean power. But enough talk about saving the planet and saving your wallet. It's time to save my sanity with a bit of fun. Let's start with the zero to 100 time, if I can find a nice, quiet slice of road. And here is a perfect spot. Okay, let's slow down. The road is empty. I'm gonna move it into sport mode. Okay, you ready? Nice empty road. Zero to 100 time, official. Three, two, one. So it's not epic, it's no slouch, but it's not epic. Let's see how well it handles the corners though. For that, I'm gonna put the speed limiter on to make sure I don't go past 100. So if I accelerate, you watch the speed OC. And it won't let me go over 100. That is such a, such a money saver. <laughs> First corner, medium left. Okay, effortless so far. No strain at all. The extra weight of the battery pack is not straining the chassis. The suspension's fine. It's a fair amount of suspension travel, which is good. It's absorbing the worst of the bumps. And of course, it's got fairly low profile tires on, so there's not too much tire roll. Right, so far so good. What's interesting, a little factoid for you, is that the center of gravity in the Corsa E is actually 10% lower than the center of gravity in the regular gas burning Corsa. 10% might not sound like much, but when you're throwing 1.5 tons around a corner, 10% better center of gravity, it makes a massive difference. Oh, that's not too bad. I think this is nearing the limit here. Although that weight distribution is almost 50-50 in this car. Can't get that with gas burning cars, not easily, it's hard. Oh, it's struggling, it's struggling over those bumpy bits. Uh, extreme cornering, the suspension reaches its limit pretty quick. 
But then again, this car is going to spend most of its life in the city, so that's hardly going to be a big issue. Yeah, this thing's not too bad, honestly. If I were to summarise it, I guess now is probably a good time because it's the end of the video, I would say it's good bang for buck, not a bad car, but I do have some complaints. Number one being that the motor driving the front wheels is only 100 kilowatts. It's good, it's no slouch, don't get me wrong. As you saw from the 0 to 100 time, it's, it's pretty, pretty quick, fairly nimble. But I would have liked it if they'd just given it a bit more power. Just so it would suit those hot hatch locks, because from the outside it is a striking looking car, I love the exterior styling. My other complaint is that the dashboard design is very traditional, and if you've seen my videos, you see how excited I get when I'm confronted with a dashboard that's not black and grey. I love wild and wacky dashboards. This one's very conservative, which you're probably finding this dashboard is perfectly acceptable. It's a, it's a stylish dashboard, the red streak is cool. Uh, but yeah, I'd like something a bit more beige. And my other complaint is that it has no spare tyre, just a pump and a can of goo. So if you wanted to go long distance, my recommendation would be to spend a hundred bucks and get a used space saver and a tyre jack, and then you've got peace of mind for long distance drives if you do get a flat tyre. And my last complaint is that it has no towing capacity at all. It has a tow bar option, but it's only for bike racks. So keep that in mind. But otherwise, bang for buck, that's where it shines because it is, as I said at the start of the video, New Zealand's most affordable European electric car. $51,365, 383 Ks. It looks great, it goes okay, it's got all the gadgets you could want. Opel might just have a winner on their hands. It's up for you, the Kiwi motorist, to decide.